Hello and welcome to our worship for Palm Sunday as we begin our journey through Holy Week towards Easter Day next Sunday. And with a word about that, um, we will be in church on Easter Day, though not on Good Friday or Maundy Thursday. I hope that for the um, time of Holy Week, we will have an online reflection. Um, but we will definitely be um, welcoming people into church on Sunday for our Easter celebration. Sadly, we missed it last year. And this year we have the opportunity to do that in our building and safely. So I very much hope to welcome you as many as possible to that occasion. But today we're at the start of Jesus's journey into the great passion, um, his death and then his resurrection. And we think about him being welcomed into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey with people waving palms and celebrating. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and also with you. Holy God, holy and strong, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. We say together, holy God, holy and strong, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. eternal God, source of all blessing, help us to worship you with all our heart and our mind and our strength. For you alone are God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, forever and ever. Amen. We sing our first song today, King of Kings, Majesty. Majesty, God of heaven, living in me, gentle Savior, closest friend, strong deliverer, beginning and end, all within me falls at your throne. love for us in that 
while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let us then show our love for him by confessing our sins in penitence and faith. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Against you and you only have I sinned and done evil in your sight. Lord, Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And now may the God of love bring you back to himself, forgive you your sins and assure you of his eternal love in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our reading today is from Mark chapter 11, beginning to read at verse 1. This morning's reading is taken from the book of Mark, chapter 11, verses 1 to 11. When they were nearing Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany on Mount Olives, he sent two of the disciples with instructions. Go to the village across from you. As soon as you enter, you'll find a colt tethered, one that has never yet been ridden. Unite it and bring it. If anyone asks, what are you doing? Say the master needs him and will return him right away. They went and found the colt, tied it to a door at the secret corner and untied it. Some of those standing there said, what are you doing untying that colt? The disciples replied exactly as Jesus had instructed them and the people let, left them alone. They brought the colt to Jesus spread their coats on it, and he mounted. The people gave him a wonderful welcome, some throwing their coats on the street, others spreading out rushes that they'd cut in the fields, running ahead and following after they were calling out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in God's name. Blessed the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. He entered Jerusalem, then entered the temple, he looked around, taking it all in, but by now it was too late. So he went back to Bethany with the twelve. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Palm Sunday is one which we look forward to in the church. It's a sort of strange thing in that we celebrate and rejoice at the coming of Jesus on the donkey into Jerusalem immediately before we go into perhaps one of the most um, impassioned and difficult weeks of our spiritual lives, the week before Jesus' death and crucifixion, which ultimately we know ends in his resurrection. Palm Sunday was the time when Jesus walked into Jerusalem and became very public about who he was. Already in Mark's Gospel, we have had some glimpses. Instead of Jesus keeping the fact that he was Messiah a secret and telling people not to speak about it, he begins to name who he is. And now you could not be clearer. Jesus' arrival in uh, Jerusalem echoes that of Solomon, who had been named king by David, and who rode into town on a donkey. And that story was not lost on the people of Jesus's time. Of course, not everybody in the crowd was cheering. And we'll think about that in a minute. Crowds are full of different people, just as society is. But I want you to hold for a moment that wonderful image, that incredible celebration as people saw Jesus for who he was, the Messiah. Of course, the big problem was they expected him to come with an army and to overthrow the Roman power that was being inflicted upon Jerusalem and the surrounding areas. People were being held under a dictatorship that they did not want. That still goes on in parts of this country. We only have to think about Myanmar and the um, rule of the army there and the difficulties that are going on um, for people in that place. 
And if we translate the one to the other, we get a sense of what it was like in Jerusalem. This celebration would have been watched by Roman soldiers very carefully. But it was also watched by the Pharisees who were jealous and bitter about Jesus's following, about the enthusiasm that he conjured and about the way that people responded to him. They were there. There were all sorts in Jerusalem on that day welcoming King Jesus into town. And it's interesting to think what changed in such a short period of time, but a few days, those who had welcomed him turned against him. People who once said, I believe he is the Messiah, now willing to uh, run away or ignore him. The question I want you to think about today is not just about what happened in Jerusalem in Jesus's lifetime, but actually, what would it be like if Jesus came to Bromborough? Now, I know that not everybody watching this lives in Bromborough, so you need to insert there your village or town, whether it's in Dorset or Wales or a place in Canada or somewhere else. What would it be like if Jesus came to your town? How would you respond? What would you give to Jesus? We don't all own donkeys, but we do own cars. What would it be like if somebody came and rang your doorbell and said, um, I've come to collect your car, uh, that grey one there on the drive and the red one that's in the garage. The red one in the garage? How did you know I'd got that car? What would you do? You'd think they were mad, wouldn't you? Would you give them your car? Would you give that to strangers? Because that car is every bit as valuable as somebody's donkey was in the time of Jesus. Well, you say to me, Jesus would have been well known. He was spoken about. But you know, he wasn't quite as well known until this moment as we think. Remember, much of his ministry was conducted in secret. He wanted to keep on teaching before the Pharisees shut him down and stopped his ministry. He wanted to pass on the gospel to others so that they in turn could share it and share it and share it just as we do now. So maybe the person who had the cult was not somebody who knew Jesus at all. And yet he would have known almost certainly who Jesus was because he would have known or who, who the Messiah was because he would have known the Old Testament. That person, he or she, would have been familiar with the stories of their heritage. Are you familiar with the stories of your heritage? Did you know that Jesus walking, arriving in a town on a donkey was a direct parallel with Solomon the king coming into town? Or is today the first time that you've heard that? We as contemporary Christians are actually really quite bad about knowing the Old Testament, knowing the heritage of our faith. And yet it's that that informs us so that we can read the New Testament and understand Jesus is coming into town. I wonder what you would be willing to give Jesus. Perhaps the hypothetical car is not a good example, but are you willing to give him something of yourself that's hugely valuable, something that's materially important, even something that you feel is necessary to you? Are you willing to hand that over to him? It could be your money. It could be your time. It could be what Jesus demands of us, which is our heart, but we have to be very careful because we can say, well, yes, I believe, quite rightly, an intellectual skill. And yes, I love Jesus. And then come in with a but, but I'm only prepared. But, but I'm only willing. These days, we struggle hard to get people to come to church for a full hour. We have two services now, one of which is shorter, which allows people who don't have that hour on a Sunday or feel it's too long to sit and be still and listen, to have something that's a little bit different and a little bit shorter. Some of you struggle sometimes with the length of my sermons, I know. I appreciate that different people like different things. And yet, 
10 minutes of our life given over to listening to an explanation or a, a, a challenge from the word of God? Is that too much? What are you willing to give to Jesus? Or are you resistant when he demands your life, your all? The other thing which I've already touched on is the people that came to watch Jesus. They were in many cases palm waving enthusiasts, people who were really keen to say this is the Messiah and to welcome him, to open their town and I'm sure their homes to him. They wanted him to be there and they celebrated and celebrated. But not everyone there was enthusiastic. Some, like the Pharisees, were jealous. They were antagonistic. They didn't want him there. It threatened their power. It threatened to change the way the things were. They didn't like the Roman rule, but they knew where they were in it. They had a degree of power over the Jews and they enjoyed that. Lots of us are people who like what we know, even if what we know isn't as good as it could be. The alternatives seem a little bit more scary. A little bit more unknown and better to stay with what you have than give that up and try something else. There were obviously those who were apathetic. They really didn't have an opinion on anything. I imagine if we'd have looked down the lines of people waving palms about six deep back, there'd be people just ignoring it, just sitting and carrying on with what they're doing. Not antagonistic, not unwilling to accept Jesus, just not really very enthusiastic about it bit of an inconvenience to them they don't actually get that worked up about anything and certainly not about some bloke on a donkey there are all sorts of people that we meet now and you are a mixture of people too how would you respond to Jesus if he walked into Bromborough or the town in which you live would you rush out at the crack of dawn to see him would you get up that extra bit early would you be somebody who was willing to stand longer than you've ever stood in order to see him? It's amazing what we can do when we're really determined, isn't it? When something is really important to us. It's strange how our bodies can almost adapt to the will of our minds. When we're determined, the body will respond. And sometimes it's easy to not be determined. It's more comfortable to stay on the sofa to stay inside, to not volunteer, to not go out. The temptation to stay at home in bed on a Sunday is enormous for me and for you. There's that joke, isn't it, that the vicar says, I only got to, I'm only going to church because I have to be there. But we can all find ourselves reluctant to respond to who Jesus is. And that perhaps is something that I would like us to reflect on as we come to the end of this Lenten period and move into Holy Week. What are we willing to give Jesus? And who are we when we respond to him? Which group do we see ourselves? And if we find ourselves wanting in any way, what can we do in order to change? And finally, I want to touch on something else. Jesus grieved a great deal during Holy Week. He grieved for the fact that the people around him did not understand. That even though he had proclaimed the message that God had sent him to do, even though he knew what was coming next and why he was willing to die on this cross, even though the people were sinful and yet because he loved them, he grieved, he wept over them. Does Jesus weep over you? I think so sometimes. Certainly I know that there are things that I do or say or think or don't do or say or think. And I recognise that Jesus weeps for my failure to understand, my lack of determination. God loves you and he wants the best for you. And that is often sacrificial and difficult. It often demands things of us that we can be reluctant to give. But I want you to think, what, what is God worth in your life? How much money? How much time? How much of your attention, your effort? 
how much is he worth to you? Because you are everything to him. He made you, he loves you, and he calls you into faith and relationship with him. May you have a truly blessed Holy Week. Amen. We affirm together the faith which we share. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins and the resurrection of the body and life everlasting. Amen. And now Liz is going to lead us in our prayers. So let us pray. Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Lord Jesus, today as we remember your entry into Jerusalem, we wonder how it must have been to be in that crowd. What would be in our minds? Would we have remembered the prophecy? Jesus, here we see you at the start of a week where the world was changed forever. You, Lord, rode in on a donkey, vulnerable, knowing what lay ahead. Thank you for the great example that your battle against evil was won not with guns, nuclear warheads, nor swords, but with love. We pray for countries and communities where there is conflict and hatred. Father, you've promised to bless the peacemakers. Give them the patience, wisdom and love that they too would challenge evil without killings or torture. Today also we remember those who were shouting to the son of David, proclaiming you as king. Lord, you are the King, but the King for all eternity. We as your followers long to be as you in this community in which we live. Give us grace to make wise choices, to encourage the good we see in people, to thank those who work hard to keep things running smoothly. And we thank you and pray for our church community. You've called us to shine as light in this dark world, to work for justice, freedom and truth, to support the needy and to declare that you, Lord Jesus, are the King and Lord of the world. Please guide us as we look to you to carry out this mission. Lord, we look to our troubled world sickness, poverty, grief and anxiety. We know because you promised that one day these will be no more. But meanwhile, Jesus, in a time of quiet, we lift up to you our friends and loved ones who are suffering. Pour out your healing spirit, Lord, and give them peace. We continue to remember the suffering due to the virus and although the vaccination is going really well here and we are grateful, but in other countries not all is well. Father, let there be a generous handling of the vaccine so that all will receive it. And we're also shocked, Lord, by the increase in violence in our homes here. Give strength to the social workers in these days as they have so many difficult decisions to make. Lord, we just love being back together in church again and we thank you for this freedom now to worship you together. Help us please never to take this for granted again. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. The collet, the prayer which joins together all our prayers, the collet for this Palm Sunday. True and humble King, hailed by the crowd as Messiah, grant us the faith to know and love you, that we may be found beside you on the way of the cross, which is the path of glory. Amen. And I invite you to join with me in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We sing together now uh, that beautiful song that has become very popular amongst churches, The Servant King. From him you came, our bliss be. Entered our world, your glory veiled, not to be served, but to serve, and give your life that we might live. This is our God, the servant's King. He calls us now to follow. now 
worship to a conclusion now. Lord Jesus Christ, you humbled yourself in the form of a servant and in obedience died on the cross for our salvation. Give us the mind to follow you and to proclaim you as Lord and King to the glory of God the Father. Amen. May the Father who loved the world that he gave his only Son bring you by faith to his eternal life. Amen. May Christ, who accepted the cup of sacrifice in obedience to the will of the Father, keep you steadfast as you walk with him in the way of the cross. Amen. May the Spirit, who strengthens us to suffer with Christ that we may share in his glory, set your hearts and minds on life and peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you today and each day. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. <laughs>